I'd like to share with you some of the results of work from our lab over the last few years, and in particular highlighting this work of one student in particular, Joe Zakular, who recently defended his PhD and um, has gone off to Vanderbilt to work in the lab of Eric Scar as a postdoc, so um, it'll be a hot commodity in a couple years when he's done with that, so keep that, mind in, that name in mind. Um, and, and again, this is growing work uh, coming out of the University of Michigan. We've um, really been championing a microbiome initiative and uh, working on host microbiome interactions and have a really strong cohort of scientists there interested in human microbiome. Um, disclosure information, I don't really have anything to say. Um, so to, to get started, my understanding is that there was an educational session yesterday on human microbiome, and I suspect many of you um, may not have been there, but as a, as a microbiologist, you know, we shared everyone's excitement 14 years ago when um, I think it was President Clinton, um, Francis Collins, and Craig Venter joined together in the Rose Garden to celebrate the publishing of the Human Genome Project um, in these two papers. Um, and then perhaps 13 years later when uh, the cancer genome of colorectal cancer was published. But as microbiologists, we knew that this was just the tip of the iceberg, that if you really want to understand the human body or colon cancer, um, you have to appreciate that these genomes are ignoring 90% uh, of the cells in the human body, which are from bacteria, and 99% of the genes, which are coming from bacteria as well, and that we are really um, a scaffold, so to speak, for bacterial partners who typically keep us healthy. But as you'll learn from these sessions today, um, if they get out of whack, well, our health gets out of whack as well. And so, uh, maybe eight years ago or so now, the Human Microbiome Project was initiated by the NIH. This resulted in the publication of several dozen papers over the last few years that came out of this funding mechanism from the NIH. Um, and, and this really was looking at health. Um, and, and there were some projects looking at disease. Interestingly, none of them were looking at colon cancer, um, but really looking at health. And um, the big effort was looking at 300 subjects that were very healthy, um, I wouldn't say they're normal because they're so healthy, um, at two or three time points that they were sampled over the course of a year or two, um, and again, again, 18 different body sites. And so recent work from my lab has taken these um, different body sites, and here is data presented from stool, where uh, we were able to put individuals into different clusters, or what we call community types, um, that you can define based on taxonomic composition. And so here are the top five genera, bacterial genera, that were found in these different community types. And so um, it's interesting to think that we can begin to partition subjects or people into different community types. Um, also interesting is that there's some rate of change that if you're in community type A today, well, you know, there's a, there's a chance that you'll ch convert to community type C or D or B um, given enough time. And one of the frustrating things is that we have no idea why you might change from one community type to another. Um, and, and again, this is a big frustration that we have that looking forward is something that's going to be really important, obviously, in trying to figure out um, how to use the microbiome as a therapy. And so the, the take-home message from this is that there really is no one human microbiome. Just like there's probably no one cancer genome or one human genome, there is no human microbiome. There's a bunch of different human microbiomes, and everybody in this room has a different microbiome. And you can imagine that gets pretty frustrating when you're trying to figure out, well, what bugs are important for colon cancer? I want everyone so different. Um, and of course, the microbiome is important in health and disease. Needless to say, important for digestion, epithelial health, development of your immune system, providing colonization resistance against pathogens. And it's been associated with a number of diseases, and most important for today is, is looking at colorectal cancer. And so the way that my lab looks at this, and I know others do as well, is that we have the typical model of progression from normal to adenoma to carcinoma, the accumulation of mutations, and this is all driven by genetics, um, diet, or other behaviors, and inflammation. And if you, if you dig enough through the microbiome literature, you begin to realize that each of these affects the microbiome, and that the microbiome in some ways affects things like inflammation. And so we see the microbiome really as a mediator between our health, our behaviors, our genetics, our diet, and progression of uh, tumor genesis. And so there's a number of individual bacteria that have been linked to colorectal cancer, 
in both mouse and mouse models and in humans. Um, Cynthia Sears is interested in, in studying enterotoxigenic um, Bacteroides fragilis. Um, uh, I know Christian Jobin, who's just across the room, um, is interested in polyketide synthase um, positive E. coli. Um, my understanding is that they have also found these now in humans. And then there's also growing evidence for Fusobacterium, which is interestingly an oral pathogen that everybody in this room has in their mouth, um, but maybe only 10% of us have in our gut to any, interest, any substantive level. Um, and so in, when we look at colorectal cancer patients, about 50% of those people have Fusobacterium in their stool. So again, there's this very patchy, inconsistent uh, framework that we begin to see looking at the microbiome and um, health. Taking a broader perspective and looking at cross-sectional studies across healthy individuals and those with varying stages of cancer, and looking at the community of bacteria in each gut, there have been a number of studies published. This is incomplete at this point. Um, but they all find that there's subtle differences, um, perhaps not super profound, but subtle differences between uh, the gut communities of people with varying uh, disease states. Uh, and again, the, the work that I'm going to talk about today is largely coming out of thesis work from Joe Zakular in my lab. Um, and, and a bit of this uh, was published in the journal mBio, and I'm going to present a lot of this data and then go beyond it towards the end of the talk. So because humans are frustrating to work with and they have long time scales, we decided to use a mouse model. Now, of course, everybody has their favorite mouse model. They all have their weaknesses. Um, the model that we chose to use was an AOM DSS model. Um, we did a lot of this in collaboration with Grace Chen at the University of Michigan. And we're interested in temporal dynamics because we know that each person is more like themselves um, versus somebody else. We wanted to track these animals over time. And to do that, then, we were able to sample stool from these individuals into, um, every day um, instead of taking down mice at different stages of the model. And so the way the model works is on day zero, they get injected with azoxymethane, and then they receive three rounds of DSS. And after about 70 days, they all have tumors. So there's complete penetrance of the model. It's another nice feature. Um, and and our, our metric on the community was to sequence the 16S gene uh, from these bacteria uh, to characterize the community structure um, in the feces. And again, we, the data I'm going to show represents these uh, triangles indicating the different time points uh, when we collected the stool. And so for the, the uninitiated, the way we do a lot of our analysis is to look at the relative abundance of the different bacterial populations in each community. So you can think of each of these stacked bar charts as a different fecal sample. And then we take this data and convert it into an ordination plot. Um, you can think of it as um, being like a, a road map, so to speak. Um, and so that if you have two samples that are more similar to each other in their composition, they're going to be clustered um, more similarly to each other um, than something that's um, more, uh, more different. And so what, what Joe had found was that running these mice through the model, that at baseline, we see uh, clusters of points here in the black, and that over the course of the model, we see a shift in the community, that the points, again, the samples have different taxonomic structure, different taxonomic composition after the model when you clearly have uh, tons of tumors at the distal end of the colon. <coughs> when you then look at individual mice over the course of the model, we see shifts in the community structure going from black to blue to green to red corresponding to these different rounds of DSS treatment. And so um, one of the questions that we have, and, and that's a big problem in microbiome research, is what, what's changing first? Do we see tumors um, that result because of a change in the microbiome, or do we see a change in the microbiome because we have, we have tumors form? Um, another way of thinking about this with obesity would be to say, you know, if we're studying obese people, are we studying the microbiome that causes obesity or the, or the microbiome of obese people? And so we then decided to run, rerun the model, taking down mice at different time points to see when do tumors start to form in the model. And so, again, at baseline, no tumors. After the first round of DSS, no tumors. And then after the second round of DSS, we start to see tumor formation, and then at the end, um, complete penetrance and large numbers of tumors. And of course, um, we can create a laundry list of different types of bacteria that are changing. 
OTU is our jargon for bacterial species. It's a, we call it operational taxonomic unit. And you can see that there's a number of bugs that go up in abundance over the course of the model and a number of bacterial populations that decrease in abundance over uh, the course of the model. Um, and many of these bacteria are from similar lineages. So the red here are Bacteroidetes, um, and the, the blue are the Firmicutes. And the Bacteroidetes are pretty good at breaking down complex carbohydrates. And the, the, the blues, the Firmicutes, are generally thought to be pretty good at producing short-chain fatty acids. But it's complicated, right? Um, we see lots of changes. So to get at this issue of cause or effect, and does dysbiosis or do the, the change in community structure promote tumor genesis, um, Joe carried out a, a pretty elegant experiment where he took bedding from mice that had not yet gone through the model and bedding from mice that had already gone through the model. And he took that bedding and used it to institute separate cages of germ-free mice where he used the bedding to colonize the mice with, with those microbiota. The hypothesis being that germ-free mice that received bedding from mice with tumors would get more tumors than germ-free mice um, that received bedding uh, from untreated mice. And so we colonized these mice over the course of three weeks and then ran them back through the model. And what we saw um, confirmed our hypothesis was that uh, germ-free mice that received the dysbiotic or tumor-associated community had significantly more tumors. Uh, the tumors also tended to be larger um, uh, than those mice that received a healthy community. And so this, again, provided support for a, a causal link between the microbiome and um, uh, tumor genesis. Another question we had was, uh, another way of looking at this, if we manipulate the microbiome, we should be able to manipulate the number of tumors that we see. And so um, ways of changing the community could include doing things like changing the diet, Introducing probiotics, putting strains into the mice. Prebiotics, again, giving them something, feeding something to the bacteria through the diet of the mouse. And then antibiotics. And antibiotics are naturally kind of a, a cluster bomb that do wholesale changes to the microbiome. <coughs> and so Joe uh, used this antibiotic approach uh, to perturb the communities. And so we designed a cocktail consisting of metronidazole, vancomycin, and streptomycin. Uh, it's kind of a, a broad-spectrum cocktail, but, but that also had the advantage that we could, we could formulate different compositions or, structure, or types of cocktails to perhaps target different types of um, bacteria to generate different communities. And so again, here we have the data from the untreated mice and then the mice that received the cocktail over the course of the experiment received basically no tumors. So again, if you perturb the community, alter the community structure, um, we saw a significant reduction in tumors. And if there were any there, they were significantly smaller. The other thing to note is that when we went back and did enumeration by qPCR, the, the bacterial load was not significantly different um, in the antibiotic treated versus the normal um, mice. So another question then would be, well, that's present, preventing um, tumors outright. Can we perhaps intervene to reduce the tumor burden? And so if you recall that between the blue, the first round of DSS, and the green, or the second round of DSS, was when we saw the formation of tumors begin. And so the question was, if we, if we hit the mice at that time point, what would, what would happen to tumor formation? And so Joe applied. Um, the antibiotic cocktail um, after the first round of DSS, right before the second round of DSS, and then continued the model. And again, what we saw with this intervention treatment was, again, suppressed numbers of tumors. So again, supporting the fact that if we manipulate the gut community, um, we can alter uh, uh, the number of tumors. And so Joe's gone on to, to do a number of other combinations of these three antibiotics and all resulting in different numbers of tumors. Um, and you can see the, the gross uh, morphology here. But again, by manipulating the community structures in different ways, we can get different numbers of tumors. And um, Joe's currently going back through and um, looking at the microbiome data for all these different um, cases to see what can we learn from the community structure in these different treated mice to better understand what types of bacterial populations are common 
among those mice with high numbers of tumors and those with very few tumors. So uh, Neil Baxter, who's another student in the lab who's following on after Joe, um, worked with Joe and me to carry out another experiment that's somewhat similar to the germ-free colonization mite experiment. And that if, if you think about the experiments I just described where we had conventional mice that we then treated with antibiotics, that those antibiotic-treated communities are all variation on a theme, right? They're all some variation or some perturbation of this original community that's in our C57 black six mice. Um, and so no matter what we do, we're always gonna have kind of some odd variation of that community. And so as an alternative, what we decided to do was to take germ-free mice and um, stool samples from donors and put their feces into the germ-free mice to create different starting positions. And then to see when we run these, um, I don't wanna say humanized mice because <laughs> the communities are not humanized and the mice, imagine, don't even look like humans. Um, but it's a, it's a common model that people like to use, but um, just don't repeat me. We humanized the mice with stool from six different donors to see if, depending on the starting community structure, whether we could get um, different tumor burdens. And sure enough, um, by giving different uh, uh, fecal samples to different mice, different germ-free mice, um, we're able to alter the number of tumors that we see. And in some cases, um, get many more tumors than we saw in our conventional um, black six mice uh, gut community. And again, um, the, the interesting thing is that all these communities started very different from each other. And for the most part, after they ran through the model, ended up at different community structures. Again, suggesting that it's not one bug, it's not one bacterial population that's responsible for tumor genesis, but it's, it's the collection of bugs um, that's either being protective or promoting tumor genesis. And so the proposed, proposed model that, that we're working with is that everybody, every one of us, um, has some community structure that's made up of bacteria that are gonna be protective against tumor genesis and bacteria that are perhaps gonna be cancer promoting. And that in normal health, the, the protective bacteria are able to keep these cancer promoting bacteria in check. Protective bacteria are doing things like producing butyrate, which I suspect we're gonna hear about in a few talks, that suppress inflammation and keep things healthy. But that something happens in some people to tweak this balance between um, protective and cancer-promoting bacteria. And so that these cancer-promoting bacteria um, become abundant and become more active. Um, we don't have so many uh, anti-inflammatory signals such as butyrate. We have more inflammatory signals um, and production of things like toxins. This is kind of the story of the E. coli PKS perhaps and the enterotoxigenic B. frag. Um, and that this then induces inflammation um, and then leading to um, increased tumors. And so it's not the microbiome or the host, but it, we really see it as an interaction between the host and the microbiome that's gone amok uh, to lead to uh, tumor formation. And so another way that we've played around with looking at this is that, again, as I mentioned, everybody in this room has a very different uh, microbiome that we could take everybody here, we could do everyone's microbiome, and there would not be a species of bacteria found in everybody in this room. That's how diverse we are. And so, again, depending on who you are and what your composition of your community is, as you go through life, um, you, know, you may end up in a disease state where you're either healthy or you've got a tumor-promoting community. And kind of the exciting thing is that if you think back to that initial slide of looking at uh, the, the human genome or the cancer genome, that these community structures interacting with uh, host genetics as well as host behaviors will lead to different levels of tumor genesis. And so this is where we're going forward with human studies and, of course, additional mouse studies. And so again, just driving home the point that there is no one human microbiome and that one of the goals we have going forward of human samples is that we have these four you know, in this study, four clusters of, of samples from healthy people, that you could imagine that there might even be a, a community type E that's indicative of people with adenoma or carcinoma, that we could begin to use the microbiome as a diagnostic um, for, for tumors, um, and then to better understand cancer as well. 
And so with that, I'd just like to acknowledge uh, collaborator Grace Chen, um, the germ-free facility, which does a phenomenal job at the University of Michigan, um, interactions with Mary Rogers, who's an epidemiologist at Michigan, the EDRN, uh, specifically Dean Brenner and Mac Ruffin, who've been helpful in <clears throat> helping to, us to get clinical samples, as well as our funding sources. And as I mentioned, the two students that did the bulk of the work, Joe Zakular and Neil Baxter. And so with that, I'd be happy to take any questions you might have. Hi. <laughs> Uh, I have two questions. The first is you use the word laundry list, and it struck me, uh, uh, you know, it struck me that uh, DFS is a deterrent. And uh, I've never understood to what extent of the nice group of DFS removes the intestinal microbiome, or is it 10%? Of the, I'm just talking about the total numbers. Right. 50%, 90%? Um, so when we've done the qPCRs, we, we don't, I don't believe we see a big difference between pre-treat, post-treat with DSS. Um, when, we, when we look at the community structure of DSS-treated mice, the, the community structure we see with the DSS-treated mice alone without the AOM is not the same as we see with the AOM DSS. So um, I, I need to double check on those numbers, but I don't think the bacterial load is changing with and without DSS. And the community structure shift we see between DSS alone and AOM DSS is significantly different. And the second question is, um, how do you control for a change in metabolism of AOM by the change in bacterial representation? Uh, which we to the yeah, so, so we've, that's a great question. So there's, so the, the my survey of the literature is that there's something of a dogma that the bacteria are involved in breaking down AOM to become a carcinogen or carcinogenic, but that we can't actually find the primary data to support that. So Joe, I didn't show it here, but went back and just gave mice antibiotics during the AOM treatment um, and then removed the antibiotics prior to DSS. And we didn't see any difference in tumor formation uh, when we kind of knocked out or changed the bacteria during the AOM phase. Um, Certainly, if, if, as we kind of saw with the human data, if we change that initial community structure, we're going to change the number of tumors we see. So um, I would say, yeah, like metabolism is important. And if you change the community, you're going to change metabolism. Um, I'm, I'm not I'm sure. On the host side, I don't know how much it's going to affect it. Fair. Two <laughs> quick questions. Second clinic from Fox Chichner for Santa. So um, one question is uh, how important do you think is to study mucosa associated microbiome instead of fecal? Because especially a part of the method DSS model, you under like mouse models undergo various changes in the epithelium with lots of mucus loss of uh, the microbial peptide. Uh, cell death and so on, and there are many really changed bacterial community type associated with mucosa and not probably so much bacterial community associated with uh, uh, right. Yeah, so the uh, question of, you know, everything we're doing is looking at stool versus mucosa, and, and that's a, to some extent, chicken-egg question that if we I guess if we crack the egg, we don't get the chicken. But you know, if we if we take down the mice to look at the mucosa, then we can't we can't track development of tumors over time. I can't look at the mucosa prior to tumor formation, um, and so that's a technical limitation we have. But we certainly think that, and we've done this with you know mice, where we look at mucosa versus lumen, and there are differences. There's a lot of overlap, but it's uh, different representation, um, and so that's certainly you know a deficiency in the model, but. Uh, we see as a strength that we're able to get longitudinal sampling of these mice and to be able to connect onset of tumors um, with you know, changes in the community structure that we wouldn't be able to see by taking down representative mice that, as we go along. Thanks. Very informative and important work. Human 
Right. With the healthy biome, you got more tumors than, than the biome of cancer. Yes. So you notice that. <laughs> so, so on the on the x-axis, there were C's and H's. So the, the actual the H's are the healthies, and the C's are the cancers. So uh, the, the mice that actually got the highest number of tumors were, were was a healthy from a healthy donor. Um, and so I would say that yeah, H is healthy, right? Um, and so we don't have a good explanation for that. I, I think the big problem is that, uh, the, like I said, the humanization doesn't work in our hands. That some of the cancer samples we picked were 80% fusobacterium because we wanted to see tons of tumors. Well, we ran the model and fusobacterium didn't stick. Um, and, and again, yeah, I didn't, I didn't show the sequence data. But, um, and I, I think you know, that's going to be a difficulty in moving human samples to mice because um, you know, mice aren't humans, that we're going to select, mice are going to select for different types of bacteria than humans. Um, to think that we can just put a bolus of a community in and that community is going to stick without going through kind of a successional process, I think, um, is something that people aren't considering when they try to pursue these humanized experiments. Time for one more. Just a quick comment, uh, since colon cancer, colon carcinomas occur in older adults, uh, mm. humans are, of course, different ages. Uh, so have you done mix and matches of young mice, old mice, young humans, old humans, things like that? Yeah, no, that'd be fascinating. We haven't, and that's something we should certainly do. Good question. Can you see the tumor sizes that you should see to some kind of biotic after the last disease report? Because when you mm -hmm. see during the test report that there's also a lot of significant inflammation, therefore you see cancer. But you know, uh, yeah, so we, we haven't done the inflammation and cancer part and the cycle part of our So are you asking if the if the antibiotics have a immunologic effect? No, I or the last type of the test yeah. the last antibiotic would be making you to go for kind of having an ECE model. That's a that's a very interesting idea. We haven't tried that, but um, certainly something that would be good. To, we did it after, before the first, second round, but if we do it after the third to see if, what effect that has on the tumors, that'd be pretty exciting to see what happens. Thanks.